Today is February 19th, 2018, and you're listening to Human Factors Cast, episode 78. Today on Human Factors Cast, we're talking about smart glasses that literally let the blind see, drones in the danger zone, and how talking good can make you a bad reviewer. Don't worry, Google, because we're ad-free and Human Factors Cast starts right now. Welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the 78th episode of Human Factors Cast. I'm your host, Nick Rome, joined today by my good friend and co-host, Mr. Blake Arnsdorf. What's up, Mr. Rome, and what's up, listeners? How's everybody doing today? Oh, man, I'm good, Blake. I don't know how you've been, uh, but this last week has been uh, pretty crazy. Pretty crazy for me. Uh, yeah, what sense? So, um, well, there's been a lot of stuff going on with... Um, with uh, my partner's sister she just had a baby uh and and man i don't really don't have a whole lot of human factors sort of uh application to this i'm sure they went through a bunch of stuff in the hospital which i didn't see but we went to visit this baby on uh on on saturday i guess and i don't know i it, it kind of um the, the experience i had was so i just to let our our listeners know i don't typically have uh, interactions with babies or small infants or or anything under the age of like let's say 26 right so my um <laughs> my experience with younger demographics are are very limited and so uh of course i got to hold this baby and as i'm holding this baby i'm looking into her eyes and she is sort of experiencing the world for the first time and i just kind of was awestruck at the sort of I, I can't even describe it like she's taking in all the senses she's feeling stuff she's like looking everywhere everywhere she's like and she can't even see yet right she's probably perceiving shapes and shadows and and maybe that's it uh blurry figures at best um but you know looking right into her eyes i like felt this connection and and, and she's like only a couple days old like i just i can't it's it's incredible to me, and um, you know, it, it kind of reminded me of how when you get turned on to sort of this field or this interest that you really sort of latch on to, you're kind of the same way, right? So you kind of like that's how it was for me in human factors when I first discovered the field. I was like, wow, this is really interesting stuff, and I wanted to learn everything I I possibly could and sort of ingest all this information and and commit it to memory, and it was just amazing to see that happen before my eyes with this baby that was brand new to the world and, and all these sounds and sights and everything. The sensory overload was just kind of, uh, I could see her processing it. And it was it was quite something, I got to say. Which, I mean, that sounds incredible, Nick, because I've had the same experience with uh, Elise's good friends just had a baby. And it's the same thing. It's like for the first time ever, they're experiencing everything and anything with all the sensory availabilities they have whether it's like trying to bite things or looking at stuff or trying to make sounds with their with their mouth all sorts of crazy stuff and it, it's it's an intense to watch and well i'll try and tie this back in if i remember because we've got a particular story about this happening maybe if you were an adult and were blind for most of your life and i can only imagine the just like earth shattering changes that's got to feel like because as, as a child we all experienced it right but we didn't have a whole lot of like pre-existing mental models or any kind of sense of what the world really was blake um, I'm, I'm so glad you brought up that story because i was actually partially going to link this into that so so thank you for picking up on that right away how about you though man what's going on with you Oh man, so there, there's something I really hate at the gym and my particular trainer requires me to do it every day that I go in there. And this is doing the rowing machine. So if anybody's really familiar with CrossFit, it's uh, it's that long machine that you sit on and you like kind of pull the the rope that's tethered to a big old fan back and you just you just basically row like you're in a boat. I love me but, some rowing machine. What are you talking about? Do you about? really? I do. Oh my god, I can't I have never in my life been able to stand it, but thanks to 
an actual little nifty gamification aspect of this particular rowing machine, I love doing it. Uh, so it's it's kind of silly, but in the little tiny display that's on the rowing machine, we actually, as warm-ups, we do a game of fish where you have to, like, basically you're, you're, you're a small fish trying to eat other fish and avoid sharks. Um which is which is a little ridiculous. I didn't even know what was going on when I first tried it. But it's one of those things where you have to really monitor your own breathing, your your power output, and you know not get eaten by sharks. And you're trying to compete against the like three other people that you're warming up with. So it's just like a lot of a lot of like extra fun into things that I really don't like to do. And it, there's like a whole there's a whole scoring system that the gym uses, and it's just it's made something that I really dislike through kind of adding a different experience to a workout a lot of fun so so i have to ask do you like the rowing machine better now that you've played this go fish game oh i do because it's taught me why i've hated it and that's because like i go just 110 (laughs) percent every time i get on it um and this like really teaches you because you're like trying to avoid things and catch other stuff um you can't go like 110 the whole time. You have to like really monitor what you're doing and you have to pay attention to different variables. You're just not like going all out all the time. So uh, it has given me a better appreciation and forms better, all that kind of stuff. So it's had a lot of benefits, believe it or not. Well, that's good. I'm glad, I'm glad a uh, game was able to get you on board with the uh, rowing machine because I, I love it, man. I love the rowing machine. Oh yeah. I, d- I just like, I did cross it for a little while a couple of years ago and I could not stand it between that and the bike. Oh God, they're my least favorite things. <laughs> <laughs> I got to talk about one other thing, man. So I just found out this week that Apple does something really unique and maybe you can speak to this because you have an Apple watch. But, uh, so I was talking with a, a colleague of mine and they have the Apple watch and I have a Fitbit. And so what I was, what I was noticing is I was kind of, co- you, you know how you can compare yourself to others how uh, like it'll show you your steps and then your friend's steps and, and show you like you do these little challenges like Weekend Warrior or whatever, right? Um, so I was talking with my colleague about, about the Apple Watch and they were saying that, you know, uh, uh, I think I, I was talking about comparing uh, varying professions, right? So my partner's on her feet almost all, the, all day long and so she gets like, 15,000 steps and meanwhile I have a desk job and so I'm getting maybe like 5,000 steps and so there's this big disconnect and um, so they were saying that they they could basically uh, check on their friend's step status right directly in the interface of the wearable Uh, whereas the Fitbit people have to go into the app and see it there and I, I just thought that was really interesting because if you think about it that is almost more encouraging to those people, if you can just have it right there saying, hey, look, your brother or so-and-so is like this many steps ahead of you. You need to catch up, right? And you can yeah, kind of monitor Yeah, that's actually it. awesome, Nick. And I didn't even know you could do that, and I have an Apple Watch, so that's even better. Yeah, and you can kind of monitor it throughout the day, and especially if you pair yourself with somebody who has a similar job to you, right? Like, so if I, was to, if I were to pair myself with somebody else who has a desk job, I can be like, oh, so-and-so only got so many steps i'm gonna go and beat them right now and then they would see it on their end and go okay i can beat them and it just makes you know it creates this competition that sort of makes both of you rise and and become better just because you're showing each other stats on the watch and i just found that really fascinating i don't know maybe some of our listeners can speak to it in our slack yeah man that's that's totally awesome i mean i didn't even realize you could do that and be that would make it so much more fun to you know run around and get steps or because i know like for at least the apple watch it's pretty good about telling you to like stand for such amount of time or go for a walk and all that kind of good stuff so like that added component of trying to outdo your buddies and being able to see it in real time that's pretty sweet yeah um okay so do we want to get into the slack stuff Let's do it. All right. So if you're new to the show, welcome. Uh, We do have a Slack. So you can go and interact with other Human Factors professionals, other listeners of the show, and uh, actually talk about a lot of stuff that we don't actually even cover on the show. So some of that stuff is random articles about Apple employees running into (laughs) invisible glass walls and, and, uh, you know, a bunch of other sort of cool stuff. We have a video of the history of Human Factors in there right now. Uh, there's there's a lot of interesting things going on in the Slack right now. Definitely recommend. Um, but I just want to bring up a couple things. So, Blake, you wrote this note here from uh, Mateo. He actually wrote last week. Um, 
uh, describing a project they have going on uh, down under, which for listeners is Australia, if you're not familiar with that phrase. Uh, at the moment, with uh, air traffic control called One Sky trying to unify ATCB. Oh, is this left over from last week? As I feel like this is left over from last week. Uh, it might be, but I don't actually remember talking about this, and this is really kind of cool, seeing as we did talk about that specific problem, right? Or of having that article and not really knowing, like, why are we trying to make civilian air traffic control and military air traffic control kind of integrate? No, no, we did. We definitely talked about this last week, and then we actually followed up um, with them, and he, we we followed up with Mateo. He basically said, uh, because we, because our our whole thing last week was, um, you know, we didn't know how it was handled down there, right? And we didn't know how integrating the civilian and military aircraft was a problem that needed solving, right? Because here in the States, we have them pretty separated. We have military airspace and uh, civilian airspace, and, and it's kind of handled, uh, kind of stovepiped. But Matteo basically said, you know, that both civilian and military traffic control systems are, are coming to their end of the end of the life. So they're they're just trying to integrate them because it's a good opportunity to try and take that unified approach, right? So I, I think it's really cool that we're sort of having these discussions and, and, you know, we say things on the show and people on the Slack come back and say other things about the show and we just have this conversation. So if you guys want to get in on it, our link is in the show notes. We have it on our Twitter and our Facebook and our website and pretty much everywhere you can find it, us. Um, I will say, though, we have got a couple emails from listeners that said they can't get on, uh, and that's okay if you can't find our link, uh, if it doesn't work in your show notes or whatever, because I know I know some podcast apps don't quite do it. Um, but you can send us an email, and we'll send you a special link, uh, and that way you can get right in and on the discussion. Um, so before we get in on our uh, news stories of the week, I want to talk about some of these events that have also popped up in our Slack. Um Looks like we got, uh, this one's yours, Blake. You want to go over this one? Yeah, so this one I didn't put in the Slack because they were still putting information together, so I got it later today. Uh, But this is Adobe's Creative Jam. They had these all over the country, but they're about to have one in L.A. on March 1st. And it's just a fun opportunity where if you've got work that you want reviewed or if you've been trying to get a portfolio put together, it brings a lot of kind of the heavy, heavy hitter design leaders in the community together to kind of review different people's portfolios. They also hold design competitions as well as it's just a giant opportunity to network and if adobe's putting it on it's going to be a lot of fun and in this particular instance it is free in la so it's on again it's on march 1st at the control collective in la so it'll be a it'll be a good time and if you happen to be there you should let me know because i would love to say hi and all that kind of good stuff yeah well that that does sound like a ton of fun and i'll have to check back in with you on that one so a couple from our slack listeners so we got la right that's that's blake's we also got world ia day in Boston in 2018. Um, that's Saturday, February 24th uh, at 9. And then we also have a shout-out for Space Hub Perth, uh, the meetup group. Um, and a uh, link to that can be in our show notes. I'll be sure to include that. So, Blake, let's get into the Human Factors news. This is part of the show all about Human Factors news. It's where we talk about everything related to the field of Human Factors. This can be anything from transportation, psychology, AR, VR, AI, all those acronyms, whatever it is, as long as it relates to the field of human factors, it is fair game. Blake, what do we got up first this week? All right. So as we all know, some technologies had the potential to truly transform and change lives for select populations. And eSight, a pair of smart glasses that gives blind people the ability to see, is exactly that. The glasses look like a cross between PlayStation VR and Avigant Glyft. Uh, And they are so effective that in some cases, the previously blind person may have the best sight in the room when wearing them. These glasses work by using high-speed cameras that view the world around the wearer and project the image into an OLED screen, where special software actually enhances and cleans up those images. There's no lag. The images produced don't have a digital appearance, and because the visor can be lowered and lifted, peripheral vision isn't ruined, giving the wearer 2020 or, in some cases, better vision. Nick, I don't know where we found the story. Well, obviously, we found it on digital trends, but this is such a cool piece of technology. I mean, literally allowing blind people to see. Yeah, yeah. I am uh, kind of blown away by this. Can you imagine not being or not being able to see your entire life, and then just all of a sudden, here it is. It's everything. 
everything. And um, it's like it's like being a baby. See, we tied it back. We did it. We tied it back. <laughs> yeah, except for like in my head, uh, and I don't know. It'd be cool to talk to somebody that maybe experiences technology, but I just feel like you would, with preconceived notions of the world, and depending on your age and your mental models you developed, I just feel like the world could be so much more overwhelming. Um, through all this visual simulation that you've never had, it, I kind of liken it to actually when I the couple times that I've been in sensory deprivation tanks, that almost like the silence and deprivation of senses is, is kind of deafening because you're so used to having sound ambient noise, having just regular sounds that you're trying to pay attention to as well as visuals. So this is almost the reverse uh, kind of action here, but the technology behind it is pretty incredible, especially as simple as they make it sound. Yeah, so I'm trying to understand how this technology works, and maybe you can help me break it down. But basically, they have these little OLED screens, right, um, that have cleaned up images, right? So I'm trying to understand how a blind person is able to see these. Do they define blindness in this article here? Is it like, is it true blindness? Or is it... I mean, they're they're talking about, or at least in the the top blurb of the article they gave was that they it potentially allows people that are blind to see. Now, if that's some kind of, you know, graded blindness, I don't think they made it explicit in the article because a, a kind of a flip side to the whole thing about this and about the article itself was the fact that this is a great technology and, like it says, it's truly a transformative one. But the problem is only very few people will have access to it because it's so expensive. I think a right pair now. of a pair of these glasses runs somewhere in the range of like $10,000. It's expensive now. It will get less and less expensive over time. And to me, this at least has... This at least lets low vision people see. Um, and you can categorize that as blindness. I myself wear glasses and often joke that I'm blind, but it it is a type of blindness, right? Where you have, um, you cannot, it, it's visual impairment really is what it is. And so I, I'm wondering if they're using the term blind uh, as a blanket statement or if they're truly people not able to see. And, uh, uh, you know, they're, they're talking about people who are legally blind um, since birth, and they can kind of only see those shadows and shapes like babies can. But then with these images that are projected in front of their eyes, they can actually perceive much, much more. Right. It, it's it's kind of like uh, if you if you ever watched any of those goofy like crime uh, shows and they're they have an image of a car and they enhance and they try to zoom in on the uh, on the license plate. That's yeah, kind, yeah, yeah. That's kind of what I'm imagining here in this scenario where you have. Uh, somebody who can kind of see low vision, very, very low vision, right? Like obviously wouldn't be able to do anything. And then, and then this, this device kind of um, projects it uh, uh, to them. So that way they can, they can see more clearly. Yeah, most definitely. I'm trying to like skim more through the article. And I mean, it does mention somebody who is legally blind who's tried this, but lo even looking at the prototype and their descriptions, I don't, I'm not quite understanding how it's kind of forcing the images uh, into your eyes to make you able to see at this like kind of amazing rate. Uh, Cause I would think there would have to be some kind of neural simulation to make that happen. If, especially if you're actually blind. I don't know. Right. It's, it's a little confusing. Yeah. That's where I'm at too. I mean, it's a cool technology. I'm excited to see where it goes. Although I'm just not quite sure how the technology works, and maybe it, uh, maybe maybe we can follow up on it. But I, I mean, I, I, sorry, uh, um, a criticism of the show, which we don't we don't read a whole lot of criticism on the show, you guys. But why? Because I, I mean, why would we? But we did get one that's always kind of echoed with me, and I want to address it right now, Blake. So we got this <laughs> one. We got this one a while back that was. How come you guys never know the stories that you post? And, okay, you have to understand that when we post the stories, we read the stories, and then we kind of revisit them the day that we record the podcast. So to us, it's a little bit of old news, which is why we suggest that you follow us on Facebook and Twitter and um, and, and in our Slack, so that way we can have the discussion uh, in real time rather than, you know... So, so yeah, we, we see these, we read these, and then we have to come back to them and we have a lot going on so we kind of forget 
So that's that's why we have lapses of memory on the show, guys. I just had to address it because we got a criticism one time, and I feel like most people would understand. But anyway, there it is. That's an aside. <laughs> Well, and not to justify this too much, but in cases like this, if you if you go and read the article, really, there's not a whole lot of meat there about what's going on tech wise. That's true. So it, it's it's more difficult for us to do anything but speculate about how it works and use kind of our past knowledge, whether it's related to human factor psychology or anything we can pull from somewhere else. Right. Or past stories, even. Uh, all yeah. right. Well, I don't have much more on this one other than, wow, that's cool. And I'm excited to see where it goes. Um, do yeah, you? blowing minds left and right. That's such a cool story. All right, let's get into the next story. All right, so last week in South Carolina, a helicopter crash crash landed and may have been triggered by a civilian drone, making it the first drone-related crash of an aircraft in the U.S. The incident involved a student pilot and an instructor, both of whom told investigators that a small drone suddenly appeared directly in front of them while the student was flying. The instructor took over the controls, attempting to avoid a collision. However, the helicopter's tail hit a tree, triggering a crash landing. So this type of accident investigation is the second involving a drone in less than a week and comes as as age aviation groups are demanding tighter regulations on civilian drones, drone use, following reports of other possible near, uh, near collisions involving these kinds of devices. So, honestly, Nick, I'm surprised we don't see this, like, more than once a week you know um, that's that's exactly what someone in our slack said brian uh, i'll call him out brian brian actually said i'm surprised this hasn't happened more only a matter of time um but yeah i this so it's interesting right because uh w- we we went through this legislation uh a while back here in the states i know we have a, a worldwide audience which is exciting but here in the states we have this legislation where you have to register your drone and um you know, so if they if if something like this does happen, they can trace back to whose drone it was and and sort of punish them accordingly. Um, and you know, up until this point, there hasn't really been a situation where that needed to be the case. And so now we're in this uh, area where we're this is new territory, right? Like people have been flying drones for years, and people have been flying planes for many years and so it's like this is where they literally collide and how do we handle something like this what kind of regulation will we see for uh drone piloting and what kind of um changes will be made right so uh i i don't know what to make of this like like we've said on the show we're not aviation experts but it's interesting to think about from um sort of this perspective right because we know, th- here's what we know. We know they already have no-fly zones around um, airports and uh, places where there could be piloted aviation uh, or piloted aircraft, right? Um, and we know that some drone manufacturers, even Mateo actually even calls this out uh, on on the article. He actually says, you know, DJI is pretty good brand uh, that does geofencing in their flight software. Um, so, uh, you know, and they, they cross reference that with a, with world airports that have no, no fly zones. Um, so I, I, people can still be reckless and, you know, fly it without their line of sight is what he says here. So, um, yeah, I don't know. This whole story is fascinating to me because, like you, Blake, I uh, and like Brian in our Slack, I I'm like, wow, why, this is the first time, really? Yeah, and I think like kind of going a, a little bit backwards. Like I I did say that I, I'm kind of surprised it didn't happen uh, more often, but I, I think I need to put a caveat in there. I'm mainly surprised because when we're talking about this, I mean, I did a lot of work when I was in grad school talking about UAVs and what it would be like to integrate them into the national airspace and then write, helping to write like guidelines that would be used by the FAA when this is really implemented. But all of that dealt with those special classes of airspace, like I, I can't even remember, A through E, I think, in which you've got like big commercial aircraft flying and things like that. But something that I don't know has really been taken into account as much and this would also depend looking at some of these other reports but in this case seeing it in like causing one a helicopter to crash which is going to fly in a totally different class of airspace in comparison to most you know commercial jets uh, but two this is also a student that's being trained so i i doubt that that was really ever too 
hardly thought about is like what areas do student students for helicopters or even small planes train in because uh, then how are you really going to regulate it with something like geofencing from DJI or anything like that like they can't be held responsible if they don't know enough information to put it within their software um, so I think this is this is kind of a a good thing to have happened in an isolated case where nobody was hurt because I think there needs to be obviously an expansion maybe of the rules for special areas at least here within the United States that are used for kind of more like pilot training versus like typical no fly zones that you have for restricted airspace or anything like that. Yeah. I'm, I'm curious as to what's going to come out of this, be it more legislation, uh, be it, um, more, more sort of no fly zones around, like you said, these student areas where, uh, you may have to, you may train at, um, you know, it's sort of these smaller airports or whatnot that maybe don't have no fly zones around them. So who knows? I mean, it's it's interesting to think about. And uh, I'm sure if you guys want to go ask our resident expert on uh, aviation, Mateo, in our Slack, he's he's pretty he's pretty active in there and be happy to talk with you, I'm sure, about about some uh, some aviation stuff. So uh, do you have any other closing thoughts on this one? Honestly, the only thing I, I think that it's going to really happen, of course, this will come through some sort of legislature, and I'd be stoked to hear what Mateo thinks on this for sure, but I, I think the biggest thing is, in this article, they were not able to identify whose drone it was. Um, and, of and of course, that could be because they were able to recover the drone, and nobody was nobody in the investigation team was able to find it, but I feel like it's gonna there's going to be more integration of kind of tracking of drones being flown by the by like the FAA or flight authorities to to really try and nail down like you you can't be flying in no fly zones because how else are they going to really police this ki this kind of flying or this kind of mishap where it's in more of a training setting right yeah and how do you enforce i don't i don't even know i'm so not versed on drones and unmanned air vehicles and sort of how the registration piece happens and you know like how do they enforce that how how do they say oh you just bought a drone you have to register it within x amount of days and how do you make sure ensure people do that like i don't know i don't know more to come i'm sure yeah all right let's move on all right so in days of picking up a Tesla Model 3, a Reddit user was involved in a wreck that promoted, promoted the unfortunate username model underscore three underscore crash dummy. Unfortunately, the driver and the pass or excuse me, fortunately, the driver and the passenger weren't seriously injured, but the Model 3 is definitely toast. The driver said that the glove box was actually jammed closed by the Model 3's tablet-like screen that, ac that broke during the accident accident the screen no longer functioned so that glove box could not be open leading to great difficulty accessing you know your typically needed insurance documents in in these types of accidents and further when the car crashed the passenger's arm hit the screen causing it to shatter and giving him some serious cuts elon musk took to twitter after hearing hearing about the driver's experience and has promised some tweaks to be made to future to avoid these kind of issues in the future Ooh, it, this this was kind of kind of a different story than usually what we pull, but it, I think it's it shows definitely some some interesting things on Elon Musk's part, like responding basically to these to these I guess really problematic things they've never never even encountered during the, you know crash dummy testing. Yeah, I'm cur I'm curious as to why this wasn't uh, discovered during crash testing right because okay let's let's recap right so you have the big tablet screen it broke um and it jammed the glove box in the process so the screen no longer functioned so you can't open the glove box without the screen that to me seems like uh a design flaw just because you should have some sort of manual override uh no matter what i i, I think right some sort of um some sort of physical manual override so that way you can open these compartments if if the touch screen does go out right so like uh you wouldn't be able to adjust your radio if it went out you wouldn't be able to do anything if that tablet screen went out basically i don't know how you open up a gas tank in a tesla just kidding <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> see what I did there. But I don't I don't know how you open up the like little battery plug to for a Tesla if you don't have that touchscreen. Is it is it typical like a like a, a little mechanical switch on the on the bottom of your uh, seat or is it something you know? Is it on the screen because I can see everything being on the screen? So what I'm saying is they don't have any built-in redundancies. Um, so they the, also in addition to all this stuff they um, they they couldn't get any of the insurance documents out of this thing right. So that's that's probably the biggest problem. And then there's also this whole uh, passenger hitting their arm on the screen. Uh, the screen shattered and uh, cut the other person, right? So they're not using tempered glass that has some sort of um, impact uh, resistance. So there's a, there's a lot of stuff going on here. And you're right. It's absolutely great that Elon is going out there and saying, hey, look, okay, now we have to address these things because this is something that we haven't discovered before. But I'm curious as to why this hasn't been discovered before. Yeah, I, I, Nick, I've really like your point that there's no built-in kind of mechanical redundancies here and that that's much more problematic i think than them not discovering it because i mean you've got to think that during testing you would have thought of what's going to happen if for some reason the tablet or the screen in the car shorts out and if all these functions are only solely accessible through this screen like we've at least got to have the very necessities accessible through some kind of mechanical parts or any kind of like just different format so i think that's a little strange and that's not something i thought of and i I, i'm surprised we haven't heard about this um you know with the tempered glass or not using tempered glass excuse me uh because of the screen shattering because that that should have happened if you were like crashing some of these at least seeing seeing some of the screens crack or something like that yeah i'm i'm almost wondering if uh there's some foul play here i'm not sure right I, i just don't know um, uh, Elon Musk is a pretty big target and I wouldn't be surprised if someone was out there trying to like sue them, sue him and, and Tesla motors. So like, I don't know. I, I, I don't f- suspect there's foul play, but, um, yeah, I don't think so either. But at the same time, not to, not to like lean towards there being foul play, but it's not very clear about the circumstances of the accident, just that there was a wreck there's no, there's not like explicit fault given or any of that kind of stuff. So I mean, it, it could have been something going on in the Model 3's car. It could have been something going on outside of it. Um, but luckily, nobody was hurt, and they came away with some pretty actionable things for Tesla and needing to change. Yeah, um, and which would be even worse. Let's say if this this was a fatal accident and things like that had happened. And it's really surprising to me that Elon just comes back with like, okay, yeah, so. We'll open this fail safe to when, you know, the car stops after a crash, the glove box will automatically open. And then, but does that introduce more sort of problems? I don't know. Um, and then, you know, they'll, they'll take a look at putting a plastic sheet to the front or back of the screen. So that way it doesn't shatter everywhere. So I don't know. They, they came back pretty quickly with, with some, uh, design options. I somehow think that those are not going to be enough. Um, unless this plastic sheet he's referring to is like a, uh, like, um, you know, one of those glasses that you put on your phone to prevent it from cracking. Um, yeah. The like shatterproof. But yeah. Honestly, Nick, I hope the, the real outcome of this is that they take a closer look at some of the, some of these kind of safety problems. Cause I think you're right. I don't think it's probably limited to the glove box, not opening and the screen shattering. I think there's probably more elements of, uh, maybe some of the car design being problematic only because they're they've again pushed the innovation envelope and so much is run just electronically. Yeah. Yeah. No kidding. Um, well, I, that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> Sounds good, man. Let's thank our friends. All right. So let's thank our friends. we got a couple new ones in the, in the mix today. And we're at Bloomberg gizmodo, digital trends and price and nomics and Jalopnik for all of our stories this week. If you guys want to follow along, like I said earlier in the show, you can follow us all over social media or even in our Slack. They get them sooner than everybody else because they are interacting with us and we want to reward you for joining the Slack uh, and for all the links to the original articles. And you can even comment and discuss with other human factors, practitioners and professionals and listeners of the show in our Slack. So do that. All right, Blake, why don't we get into our last story? Oh, no, second to last story of the week here. 
Yes, sir. All right. So the internet truly empowers people to share what they think. I mean, you're listening to a Human Factors podcast. And much of the time, these posts are not particularly useful, but sometimes even harmful. But posts in, for e-commerce websites, better known as reviews, have been truly revolutionary. So without even seeing a product, people can make well-informed decisions before buying just by reading reviews from other people. Not all reviews are created equal, as I'm sure you're aware. Some are thorough and provide details on specific product features, while others are vague and sometimes unintelligible gibberish. Research from Priceonomics shows that people put a higher value on well-written reviews compared to negative ones that tend to have higher rates of misspelling and incorrect punctuation. While, uh, in contrast, a five-star review typically is shorter and often does doesn't actually include punctuation. So from their research, they've concluded that people writing negative reviews create longer and more arid fill pros than those sharing only positive ones. Nick, I don't know. I wanted to ask you this when I was reading reading through this, because yeah. maybe it's just me, but okay. this sounds counterintuitive in some ways to me. So are you saying that in your mind, if a... Review is is uh, longer form, well spoken. You think that somebody's trying to bribe somebody to write a good review, or um, that it is superficial and that it's well crafted, so you don't trust it. Uh, that's definitely true. But I, I guess maybe here's the point, and this is an end of one problem. But sometimes I do find it for some of the things I buy on Amazon. I like to write longer reviews that provide more description. Um, there and I try not to like have any kind of error filled prose, but I usually look for people that are writing a little bit more, especially if it's kind of an expensive item that I'm trying, that I'm thinking about purchasing sure. so I can get a little more information. Uh, so it's, it just kind of surprised me that it's the opposite really, right? There are, they're finding that people are, people writing these negative reviews really give you a lot more prose, uh, a lot more content, whereas the positive ones kind of keep it simple and to the point, which makes sense too. Yeah, well, I don't know. What do you do when you write reviews? Uh, I usually write like two or three sentences of, of well spoken, um, short to the point, right? Like, I don't typically write reviews unless I'm either really blown away with a product or uh, really not blown away with a product. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> the product is less than stellar. Um, so let's. Let's take it from that perspective. So I, I do like two or three sentences of like, here's what it is. Uh, it is it is or is not kind of what it was advertised. And here's some pros, like P-R-O-S, not P-R-O-S-E. Uh, here are some pros. Here are some cons. Um, and my overall takeaway. And so, yeah, it's, it's, it's really interesting that they're saying that these um, sort of longer reviews... Um, that are well written. Uh, wait, hang on. So now I'm getting confused. It's basically saying that negative reviews, right? They they are longer but more error filled. Yeah, yeah. Than totally. those that are than... which is, which is so strange, right? Because if if you're like not taking the time to kind of check your spelling or make sure you're using the right punctuation but you're writing a lot of stuff i just i just find it kind of odd that it would those two things co go together to correlate towards negative reviews so i i get it but at the same time so okay so let's go over why i get it i get it because if you think about it from this perspective right so you're happy with a product right you got nothing to say i'm happy with it here's my rating I'm negative. Let me tell you why it is it is not a good product. And because I'm angry, I'm typing angrily into my phone because I just got this thing and I'm so angry and I'm going to make more errors. Yeah, okay. No, now I totally see it. For okay. sure cuz that that definitely makes a whole lot of sense. We got it. So, why is this in human factors news? Uh just because human factors uh, well, buying online is like a, a new way to interact with the world, right? I would say. And so understanding what, you know, sort of these reviews, Blake, like you said, you do a lot of research on, especially more more expensive items. Understanding how these reviews are formed um, can inform you, really. So I don't know. I, I, th I, th I thought it was good. Well, I think another point there too, Nick, that you brought up is 
knowing this, knowing that typically the negative ones are these really long, prosy um, reviews versus positive ones, typically, unless you're, your name is Blake, writing really short and to the point responses, if you see something super long, like you talked about, it could be not nefarious, but it could be somebody that's put been put there as kind of just a, a probe, right? It's not a true review. You might want to read some more. So I think that's that's enlightening. That's enlightening for me, for sure, because I've never actually thought of it that way. Uh, but two, I think you're right, Nick. The, the change in our culture to this such everything's being driven by the internet from the way we communicate with each other to the way we buy products. But now being able to kind of trust not only the platform that we're buying from, but the seller that's selling the product in the case of something like Amazon, who we don't know or often don't find out who they are unless they follow up with us later. And now we're also trusting people that we have no idea who, if this is their real name, but we're basing some purchasing power off of what they're saying. And I think it's just really an interesting total paradigm shift for when, they, when we didn't really have the Internet and we were still using, you know, touchstone mobile phones to where we are now and how right. much has changed. You know, one thing that I'm not sure if the article actually addresses or not, um, and this is from Priceonomics, which is really interesting read. Go, go, go read it if you get a chance. Uh, is is the verified, um, the verified seller on Amazon, right? Because to me, they're just kind of performing this analysis of length of review, spelling errors, improper use of grammar on these reviews, and. I, I, people can review bomb. People can sort of get their their internet army on a product and say this is a this is not a good product and and write a bunch of stuff about it. And so I'd be curious as to looking at their methods, right? So so we know that they're using a hundred thousand reviews from thousands of different products um, to standardize them. But I'm wondering if uh, you know within those they sort of took a look at sort of these subsets of like what are the ones that were review bombed or what are the ones that are verified Amazon purchase or whatever you know because uh, those are the ones that I trust more is like when I see oh somebody else actually bought this and it was verified with the account um, that holds a little bit more weight to me than somebody else just like buying it in person and then reporting back on Amazon because it's why, why would you put in your time to do that if you didn't buy yeah, it? Yeah and you're definitely right, and, I th and just going back to the article, really the only way they standardized what they chose or what they were looking at was they, they made sure that their data inputs were standardized by specifically using reviews that had a star rating to help them determine if it was negative or positive, as well as a review. So you're right, they're missing some pretty key, especially when we're talking about Amazon, but even other e-commerce stores, they're missing some pretty key elements here about whether somebody actually bought the product or are they coming in here and just kind of saying things based on maybe something their friend said, something they heard somebody say on YouTube, is it genuine or not? Right. All right, well, why don't we get into our last story of the week? Yes, and I was so excited about this when you posted it. But anyway, so it's finally here. Google's great adpocalypse is now upon us. So Google's Chrome browser began to automatically fil filter out ads that don't meet certain quality standards last week. Your browsing experience is about to change a little bit. And some of the features include muting autoplay videos with with sound and enforcing ad standards from Get Ready, the coalition of better ads, amongst others. The system works by analyzing pages on a specific domain, determining if any of the content offends these ad standard categories. And sites that don't manage to get a passing grade will be notified by by Google, and they will be able to review an ad experience report for details on what they need to change. If a site, however, ignores multiple warnings, its ads will be blocked by default after 30 days. So, Nick, this is this. I can't make my mind up about how I feel on this because I I really like the idea that Google and it sounds like other people. I think they include Facebook in this coalition of better ads are taking a stab at trying to calm down some of the ad space we're seeing um, on more websites, which is which is good for a lot of potential users. Uh, but at the same time, I feel like it's giving a lot of powerful companies the, the the power to kind of choose what gets put out there and what doesn't. Sure. I So the big takeaway for me was, oh, there's this thing called Coalition for Better Ads. And if you go to their website, it's really cool. So they actually have it's almost like a style guide for ads. Right. And they tell you, like, what types of ads you can use and sort of what what information goes best in these type of ads, right? 
like uh it's it's so cool man it's really cool to look at this stuff although i i don't work with any of it um so uh, that was the first thing that i thought of when i saw this article was oh today i learned but um you you bring up a good point right so it it is google is then now becoming the gatekeeper of what do what does its users see and that incorporates a little danger only because um well i don't know if it it, it doesn't provide any danger to the user it provides danger to people who are producing bad ads, which to Google, it, they're just trying to force other people to make the ads more in line with um, sort of these standards, right? And and ultimately, it's, it's getting back at the user. I'm trying to find where, like, Google sort of comes out ahead with this, right? Because, I don't know, like, they're, they're filtering ads that don't meet their standards, so they are, in a, in, a, in essence, sort of defining what these standards are, um, but they're using this coalition of better ads, uh, the, the style guide, for, for all intents and purposes. Yeah, I mean, the only place I really see it, they come out on top, and it, it's kind of big. Like, Chrome is, is very widely used, right? And now they've just basically potentially i don't know if they, if this is the end all but they've killed any other like extension ad blocker software or the need for it no um, they if haven't they're gonna, if it, <laughs> yeah well i i don't know if, they, if they've integrated it in there maybe they have maybe they will and i just think it makes the browser more attractive and then then again i mean we're working with this coalition of uh, better ads. I mean, this has got Facebook involved in it, who has their own kind of like ad management system. I feel like Google, Google's definitely got their own kind of ad management system. So I feel like although they are like enforcing standards, they're also kind of giving their platform more uh, monopoly space, right? Yeah. So I think I think you said something there that that I don't quite agree with. So you said that. Google is now sort of um, replacing the need of, of these other ad blockers. And I disagree with that. So what Google is doing is it's filtering the ads that it shows to people just as long as they meet these standards. Now, what ad blockers do, I still highly recommend Adblock Plus. They don't pay us. Uh, this, is not, this is not advertisement. I recommend that because it blocks everything. I haven't seen an ad on my computer in ages. Uh, but yeah, yeah I, I use it too. Actually, I, I learned that from a, a fellow PSE. -er. But yeah, I I agree. I do still use AdBlocker Plus. Yeah, it's 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 one of those things where like this will filter. So a lot of people don't know about it, and a lot of people don't use ad blockers. And the vast majority of people that use the internet just take everything at sort of face value, right? And so this will help protect them, but to help protect the more savvy internet user you'll have to have something like adblock plus to get rid of everything so i don't know i think it's i think it's an interesting story and, and something to definitely be considered but i really like the fact that there is a a, uh, a style guide for ads i don't know i think it's great actually kind of a funny tidbit because of this story and reading that and think it was funny last night when i was on a call talking about building a facebook uh, manager ad campaign this uh, helped me kind of get some design ideas for how to put the campaign together. So <laughs> it's super helpful. If anybody has to do any kind of marketing, um, check it out. Yeah, yeah, for sure. All right, well, uh, why don't we get into it, it came, came. It came from Reddit. It came from. It came from Reddit. Let's do it. Man, I forgot my own uh, little intro there. All right, anyway, okay. So this is the part of the show it came from reddit so this is where we search all over reddit to bring you topics the community is talking about so any subreddit is fair game as long as it relates to the field of human factors and encourages discussion amongst you guys the listeners the community everything is fair game all right so blake we got time for one of them tonight uh which one do you want to do one two three four. Oh, uh, i don't know nick um I was I, honestly, I was kind of interested in hearing your answer to the first one, like obviously replacing UX expert with human factors, because I, I thought this was kind of an eye opening experience uh, in my job, especially when I was working more as a human factors engineer. All right. So let's take it. All right. So this one is titled UX experts. Uh, what is your favorite best slash most interesting insight you've uncovered on the job? 
And this was uh, on the user experience subreddit by Risty Manchego. I think I pronounced that right. Goes on to write, uh, cruising Reddit recently, I stumbled across a post about Pornhub, of all things, incorporating last watch video before leaving site. Data into their algorithm for best movies. This awesome insight about its users and their behavior got me thinking about other industries and how consumer slash user insight can be a powerful thing when properly discovered and implemented. Got any of your own uh, learnt through your career to share? Um, so, Blake, I, I, I'm curious to see what your take is because you were really eager to sort of hit this. Yeah, so my take was, especially when I started out working in, as a human factors engineer, is you... You go through you go through a lot of schooling in grad school, learning different methodologies, trying to you know iron out processes to use so it prepares you for the working world. And I got to work with a lot of great people, but the one insight that I continued to come to was that no matter how much you think you know, users are going to tell you something that's going to blow you away that you had not even thought of. And I've still seen that in web development projects that I've worked on, freelance app stuff, uh, whether it's for for financial for military or for just people that are building apps like you there is so much value in actually interacting with a user um that i i think a lot of people discount and they they really get stuck in this we're making a lot of assumptions and building prototypes before we ever talk to anybody so my most valuable kind of insight was that you never really know as much as you think you do and it it made me much more kind of Faithful is probably the wrong word, but it's the best one I've got. Much more faithful in the methodology that I'm trained in and the background that I have because it's it's just so true and you have to get out there and interact with people in order to build the products that they, they need in some cases. Yeah, I, I completely echo your thoughts there, Blake. I think that actually getting in front of users and and talking with them has been some of the most enlightening part of my job. It it You can't substitute that you can you can work closely with people who know sort of roughly what to expect but actually getting in front of people who are going to use your product that is the changing the the defining part of of uh, at least for me at least as a as a human factors engineer that is the defining part of my job and so since you took my answer blake i'm gonna go ahead and pivot here <laughs> and say you know the, the another insight for me that has been really interesting. And I'm not saying this just from my personal experience. I've talked with other people in the field, but is how both similar and dissimilar uh, sort of the industry's approach to human factors is, right? So we all kind of have this rough idea that, you know, we, we have to interact with users and um, some people use usability tests and some people use cognitive walkthroughs and some people use uh, flow charts and diagrams and whatnot. But everyone is all kind of aimed at the same thing as getting this user feedback and incorporating it into their product. Right. And that is the seminal sort of thing to um, to think about. And it's it's just interesting like I said, I'm not saying from my perspective, but from from talking with a bunch of people in the field, they use various techniques and various uh, sort of um, methods that are both similar and have such interesting little uh, sort of unique pieces about them that make their processes work for them. And you have to be adaptable in this field. So I don't know, that's another thing that I, that I, I kind of think of when I think of uh, interesting insights in the field. Yeah, Nick, that's a great point, especially for the the place, because I used to work where Nick works now, and that's I saw that a lot at Pacific Science because there's there such a gamut of people with different backgrounds all working on human factors projects or human factors needs, whether it's research or actual like software development and the variation in the methods you use that lead ultimately to the same crux that you're, you're getting information from users to build a product that makes sense for them. Uh, but there's so many different ways to go about it and no way is necessarily better than the other. You just have to make it work for you depending on the situation that you're in. And it's kind of the beauty of human factors and why I think 
the methodology aspect is really what's underlying a lot of people that say they're like UX researchers or UX designers. Like it's that interacting with people to give you the real answers to the questions they have. Yep. Yep. All right. Well, uh, I think that's going to be it for today, right? Are we done? I think so. All right, let's get out of here. That's it for today, guys. If you have any news stories that you think we missed, let us know. We'd like to hear from you. Uh, let us know what you think of the stories this week, though. Did you like them? Did you hate them? Um, if you did, uh, you can let us know in our Slack. You can join the discussion over there. We have our, like I said, link to the show notes in our link, <laughs> link to the Slack in our show notes on our Twitter, on our on our website, everywhere you can find us. You can pretty much find that Slack, or you can email me at, uh, at us at human factors. Wow. All right, <laughs> this is a. <laughs> The Let's start this over. Ever. It's the best outro ever. All right. You can email us at humanfactorscast at gmail.com, and I'll give you a special link to that. So you can head on over to the Human Factors Cast LinkedIn, Facebook, or Twitter for all the all the articles. You know what I'm talking about. Check out our SoundCloud. You can leave us a comment over there. Leave us a voicemail at 901-646-1432. That's 901-646-1HFC. You can also support us financially on our Patreon at patreon.com slash humanfactorscast. We love it when you support us financially. If you don't have money, that's okay. This is clearly not a not a not a top notch production because I'm messing up the outro all over the place. <laughs> that's okay. You can support us on uh, review us, subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, the Google Play Store, whatever your favorite podcast directory is. We love hearing from you guys for reviews because that is the only way that we grow as a show. And of course, you can always reach us at our home on the web, humanfactorscast.com. Mr. Blake Arnsdorf, thank you for dealing with my terrible, terrible outro. Where can our listeners go and find you if they want to talk about Tesla's horrible design flaws? Oh, my goodness. Nick, thank you for being an awesome, awesome host per usual. Listeners, thanks for listening and taking the time. But you can always find me at Don't Panic UX on YouTube, Twitter, and Instagram. Yeah, you got a new YouTube series. Plug that thing. Oh, yeah. So I'm doing five minutes of UX questions, and I got a new podcast called The UX Rant. Check it out. Excellent. As for me, I've been your host, Nick Rome. You can find me on LinkedIn or Twitter at Nick underscore Rome. Thanks again, guys, for tuning in to Human Factors Cast and dealing with this terrible outro. Until next time, it depends. It depends. Wow. Can I have messed that up any worse? This outro is for super fans. Ha <laughs> ha!